mouth. And uh, we've realized from last week that our mouths are incredibly powerful. We are powerful because of our words. The Bible says we have words, uh, and, and, and our words have changed us. We, ooh, we are, we, ooh, ooh, we, ooh, ooh, are. We, we are who we are because of words spoken to us, about us, and over us. Many of us are, we are who we are because of the words that have shaped our lives. And um, we want to look at that, 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 that we want to uh, continue to examine that the words have the potential to direct the direction and the quality of our lives. And um, we, we've been seeing that James, we've been looking at James. Man, James said an amazing thing to, to, to say. In fact, he said, your words are like a little spark and they can set a forest on fire. He also explained to us, listen, if that's not enough, let me say to you how a whole horse, this massive powerful animal can be controlled if you can control the mouth. If you can control the mouth, you can control the whole being. And of course, James also said, if that's not enough, let me tell you about these massive ships. They're controlled by a little rudder. Okay, you go up into the wheelhouse and you can control the, the, the rudder. You can control the whole ship. And, and of course, at the end of it all, these are the words of James. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Be quick to listen. Josh, please, uh, quick to listen, slow to speak. And, and this is a, a massive advice. James is going to say, the tongue, it's untamable. You, you can't tame it. But you know what? You can manage it. You need to put a guard at the side of your mouth. And, um, you know, we're, 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 so, uh, we're so quick to judge other people. What they, did you hear what she said? I cannot believe what she said. I, oh, I don't, we, what we, we refer to other people's language, but we're so slow to control our own tongues. Now, in lesson number two, we, we said we need to remember the potential of our tongues. We need to surrender our tongues and our mouths to God, and we need to confess we have said something out of, uh, out of, uh, out of godliness, out of our Christian lives. We, we have said stuff. We need to confess, say sorry, and get on with it. Now, today we want to move on to have a look what Paul has to say about me and my big mouth. In fact, Paul has a lot to say about that. You remember, Saul was this man who um, originally, he this great Jewish man, always a Jewish man. His name was Saul, and his job was to, to put down this rising knockoff Jewish religion as he saw it. The Christian religion, the Christian church that was rising up because Jesus rose from the dead. It was undeniable. Hey, Clyde, I, I liked your, your Lord's Supper today. Those pictures were just a phenomenal. You know, they just, it, it, incredible how Christianity just changed the world. And, and you look at those pictures, especially the last one, is, and it's going to reflect on what we're going to be speaking in our Bible study today. Jesus, the last picture shows Jesus, five women around him. We're going to talk about that because the significance of women in the lives of Jesus. Um, but how Paul uh, wanted to get rid of these Christians and how he got permission from the high priest to crucify them. And, and then he had a Damascus Road experience. Some of you, we use that expression today. He had a Damascus Road experience. If you've ever had an experience that you, you'll say, man, then I saw the light, or he saw the light. It's from Paul there was this light, and he saw the light, and he changed his life. He was baptized into Jesus Christ. He became a Jesus follower, and then he established Christ, uh, churches left, right, and center all over the place. And, and um, then afterwards, he wrote to those letters. Sometimes he wrote from prison. Other times he just couldn't get there. He wrote to those, those, um, those churches that he had established, and one of those is uh, in, in, the, uh, in the city of Ephesus. In fact, we, we, we believe Paul wrote that letter. It doesn't specifically say uh, that in some of the manuscripts. So he established this church in Ephesus, and we have this letter called Ephesians, this letter to the church in Ephesus. And, and Paul talked about this, uh, a number of things. And one of the things he said, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. You watch your big mouth. Uh, and and, and he, uh, you remember when we looked at James, James left us hanging. 
hey, do this, do this, do this, do this. You just carry on to the next subject. Whoa, finish. How about a solution, James? Well, Paul kind of takes it a little further in this letter. He takes us further down the road and helps us out. And he's going to say, now, if you're a pagan, you're not accountable to your mouth. But as Christians, you, you, you're new in Jesus Christ. You are responsible for the words that come out of your mouth. So I'm taking you to Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to go from verse 17. Please can I ask you, folks, bring your Bibles. Uh, I, I spoil you on, uh, on a Sunday morning, but in our Bible studies, when, uh, when, when we get a chase all over the place, we, we don't always do it in a regimented way, because people ask questions and we'll go, bring your Bibles, bring your Bibles. Um, and it's going to be, I, I think it's going to be wonderful for us to, to pool our resources as we see what Paul has to, to say there. Chapter 4 and verse 17 um, Paul says, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. This is not just Paul speaking. Hey, listen, I'm apostle of Jesus Christ and I'm speaking to you as if the Lord is speaking to you that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. There's a, there's a futile way to think. Now, you need to not do that anymore because you have a different world view. I, I, love, uh, I love the Truth Project. One of my favorite things I ever did was the Truth Project with Dell Tackett, and he talked about a worldview. Is that when you become a Christian, you change the way you think, the way you see things, and Paul is saying, stop thinking like, uh, like Gentiles do, like you in, 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 in the world. You'll be, your, your words and your thinking must reflect the fact that you are bought with the price, that you are an heir of the kingdom, and uh, you have a new world view. Verse 18, they, uh, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. The, I mean, these, these people, you see in the old days, many gods. Polytheism, that's where they came from, to monotheism. Many gods, one God, Yahweh. And from the many gods, they, they followed what the gods want. You know, might made right. Whoever was in power, they just made the, the rules. And of course, you were just really blessed if you were a Roman because you had all the power. And, um, you know, those days, the men had all the power. Women had no power. It was just a, the winner takes all. It was just chaos. But not so in your new way of life. Verse 19, having lost all sensibility, they have given themselves over to sensuality as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. Now, let me tell you, this is the way the Gentiles live. You Christians should not be like that. Oh, they had even had things like temple prostitutes. They believed it was only the, the knowledge, you know, um, and, and the, the body was, uh, you could do anything with your body, but that, was, that, that wasn't important. And so they did the most horrific things in the flesh they were incredibly immoral and we know that morality for christians is massive i mean paul speaks all, all the biblical writers write about how important morals are how important faithfulness in marriages and the, what we do with our bodies sexually but the pagan gentiles had had no expectations morally because they had no rules to live by man whatever you comes into your mind you can just do it not so with the new world view. Now, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 20, Paul goes on to say, that, however, is not the way of life that you learn. Fulela read for us this, this morning. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him, according to the truth, there's a new truth at hand here. And, uh, folks, this is incredible. The new truth is that things have changed in Jesus and everybody should be grateful for Jesus and the Apostle Paul and, and the early church because they advocated a brand new thing that we just take for granted. They advocated individual rights. Well, individual rights didn't always exist. They advocated um, that everyone should be treated with dignity. That was not the case in the pagan world. We, we, they advocated, Jesus brought in, in the Apostle Paul, we're going to see in the early church, that women should be treated with respect. Not the case in the Gentile world. 
Woman had no rights. You couldn't inherit property. You couldn't testify in court. You couldn't even sit by your husband uh, in, in church, in the synagogue, in the, in the temple. That was a different world altogether. And all of a sudden, women and slaves and prisoners had rights because of Jesus and Paul and, uh, the, the, and the early church. I mean, we just assume now today, you don't pick on poor people and abuse them. Not so in the pagan world. And um, you just, you know, you just have to go to, to non-Christianized countries to see this. I mean, go to, go to, can I say that like the Muslim world, I'm just thinking those pictures of Clyde this morning uh, uh, up here. Th those, are, those are in Europe. Western Europe. Uh, and, be, and you can see from town to town to town what the, 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 the way that Christianity has changed the way that people live. But go to countries where there is no Christian rule and see how women are abused who have no power, treated by their husbands, just treated like, they just treated like items and entity. In the Gentile world, might made right. Whoever had the gold made the rule. And if you were a Roman, you were cut above everyone. Thank you to God for this new world view. Verse 22, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, the, your polytheistic way of life, to put off all your old self, which was corrupted by deceitful desire. Deceitful desire. You know what a deceitful desire is? It's a deceitful desire promises you things and then never delivers. They promise, ah, don't, don't worry. You, I know you're married, but don't worry about that. I promise you, oh, it's going to be amazing. Just go for it. And you know what? doesn't deliver. A deceitful desire. It's not just a desire. It's a deceitful desire, Paul calls. Paul says. It's a desire that is deceitful. It promises you and then never delivers. And then it whis whispers to you, oh, oh, sorry, so, uh, uh, next time. Next time, just go for it again and again and again. And Paul says, beware of this. We have put off that old uh, life. And then uh, he carries on in verse 23 and verse 24. Uh, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. Now we, we change the way we think. And to put on the new self, created it, uh, to be like God, not the gods, to be like God. Not the polytheistic God, like to the monotheistic, there is one God who has taught us how to live, to think, our attitudes, our behavior, uh, to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And now Paul says, let's get to the tongue because it affects the entire way we behave. Verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. This is just an incredible. You've put on a new way of life. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. The word for talk is the word logos. You know, you, you know from John chapter 1, uh, Jesus called the word. In the beginning was the word, the logos. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh. It's, it's this word, but, and it's the same word that we have here for logos. But the word for unwholesome, that's a very interesting word and i've got a little graphic for you put up the next slide there josh the word unwholesome means rotting fish or, or rotting vegetables or rotting fruit and so he said do not let anything unwholesome you know that that rotting stuff don't let it come out of your mouth i hope you write that in your bible because and wholesome talk, you know, we, we can skirt around, we can make it, ah, Paul, you know what, Paul says, I tell you what, some of the stuff that we say to one another, the way we speak, man, it's, it's rotten. That, that is unwholesome talk. It's, it's like having a rotten fish, rotten uh, vegetables, rotten fruit in your, your mouth. Do not, as a Jesus follower, uh, do that. Avoid having a fish mouth. And that's unwholesome talk. And Paul says, just, you, you know, tell the truth. The pagans didn't have to tell the truth, but although they knew telling the truth was the right thing to do. And so we tell the truth. Don't let 
the rotten stuff come out of your mouth. You can't, you can't forever say, I'll never say that again because we know. We've just said we won't say that again. We do it. He said, put a guard. James said it's untamable. Paul says, put a guard by your, your mouth as a gatekeeper. Avoid fish mouths by putting a guard by your mouth. Verse 20, uh, 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their need. This is incredible. But only what is helpful for building others up. Folks, this is an incredible word. This word helpful, you know, it doesn't mean to say you only have to say nice things. Because sometimes if you're only saying nice things, that's not helpful to people. When people mess up, you need to sometimes be helpful, you know, it might be a little hurtful in the thing, but going forward, it might be helpful. That's why we, we, we talk about, we, we admonish one another in uh, we, we, scriptures that talk about that. So helpful doesn't mean I'll always say pretty, you know, nice, scented words. He says, uh, be helpful for building each other up or building others up. This is a construction word, a construction word. And it means like, Whenever you're in a conversation with somebody, it's a construction site. How's your building going? When you leave the construction site, is there progress? Has there been progress in the building uh, up process? Can you say you left the construction site better than when you arrived? You know, unfortunately, many of us, with our mouths because we're unskilled and, you know, we can't control it and we've got this unwholesome fish mouth talk. After we've engaged in a conversation, we've left the construction site worse off. And Paul is saying, now listen carefully now. Watch what you say and only speak what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, according to their needs. But listen to this, folks. Isn't this true? When we speak, we can't wait for the other person to just be quiet so we can get in there because we want to tell our story. And we use the word I all the time. You know, we want to have the last word. We want to make it clear how smart we are, how sensitive we are, how amazing we, as, as, uh, we, we are in that construction site. Paul said, uh-uh, that's unwholesome stuff. When you speak, Speak what is helpful for building other people up according to whose needs? Their needs. I take care of your needs and you take care of, of my needs. But too many times, our words, we do all the talking, you know, and we leave that construction site, that, that, that verbal exchange feeling so good because, man, hey, I really told them like it is, you know. They will never forget that again. And we go boast to somebody else. Boy, I really told him. I really gave it to him. No, your construction site is in tatters. 4 and verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, when you're in a, con in a, in a, in a discussion with somebody and you're putting them down and you're saying ugly things about them, you know what? The Holy Spirit is saying, hey, but that, that is my child. I love that child. How can you say those ugly things to me? In other words, don't say something to someone who God loves, which would make God say, oh no, and grab his head with both his hands. Your words are not building material. There is like this wrecking ball that come in. Do not do something to undermine. And then verse 41, he carries on in the very next verse. He says, get rid of all bitterness. Now folks, now Paul is getting into our business. He really gets up right under our chin and he speaks into our face. He grabs us with both ears. Listen to me. Get rid of all bitterness. Paul is going to go into the root cause of why so many of us have, have a problem with, with this, with tearing people down and saying ugly stuff and, and our words are just this wrecking ball. Bitterness, Paul said. It's bitterness. Here's why we tear down instead of building up. Bitterness, get rid of it doesn't mean stop. He said, I mean, just don't just stop it. You pack it up you, and, you, and you throw it away. Bitterness shows us not only in what you say, uh, shows up not only in what we say, but, but how we say. It just comes up there, you know, and your bitterness will see right through you, through you. So, folks, 
What is, what is the antidote to bitterness? Have a look at, at this. Bitterness requires forgiveness. Bitterness requires forgiveness. A and where did that bitterness come from? Where did bitterness come from? I'll tell you where it came from. It came from words spoken to you, about you, and, and, uh, and, and, and over you. And Paul says that you cannot be a builder as long as you are harboring bitterness and the antidote for bitterness is forgiveness. And, and here it is, folks. Have a look at this. Forgiveness is giving someone from the past what they don't deserve so we can give those around us uh, what they do deserve. Um, forgiveness is giving someone from the past what they don't deserve so we can give those around us what they don't deserve. We've been hurt in the past, so that bitterness creeps in and damages our relations right here. So Paul's saying, if, you, if you've been hurt in the past by someone and you don't forgive them, that person, that, that bitterness will result in you being a destruction wrecking ball in your current relations. Verse uh, 31, not only get rid of all bitterness, but he talks about rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Boy, I tell you, Paul, he just gets after it. He just lays it on the line. I don't have to talk to all about these, but just get rid of these things. Rage, anger, brawling, slander. What's that? That's your former way of self. This is not your new world view because of what God in Christ uh, that's for you. So he said, get rid of all world words that demean, degrade, and disrespect other, others. Get rid of all words that demean, degrade, and respect others. Demean means, uh, demean means you, you don't matter. It, it's a put down. But your heavenly father would say, man, they matter to me. Build them up. Degrade. What does degrade mean? Speaking as, as if somebody doesn't make the grade. You, they, they just don't make the grade. Because where they live, how they draw, whatever, 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 wherever they work. They, they don't make the grade. And, um, you know, that's why Jesus was sent. So we've all made the grade. And then, of course, ultimately disrespect. In other words, you are not worthy of my respect. And God said, hey, that's, a, that's one of my children. Don't speak about my children. That's, that's my son. Don't disrespect my son. He is worthy of respect, bought with a price, uh, and he's one of my children. Verse 32, be kind. Here you're on the antidote for all that. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Here it is, forgiving each other. God has forgiven you. Why don't you forgive them? God has forgiven you. You have no right to hold a grudge against others. And so the platinum rule is this. Do for others what God in Christ has done for you. Do for others what God in Christ. Josh, please bring that slide up. Do for others what God in Christ has done for you. You know what the golden rule is? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But there's a rule higher than that. And this is the rule. Do for others what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. Verse, uh, and and, and we, when we move on here. Speak about others as God in Christ has spoken over you. Can you imagine how this worldview would change relationships? How, can you imagine how things would change when we take ownership for the mess that we have made with our words? Just by saying, I'm sorry, I should not have spoken like that. That's now when you allow God's grace to shape your words and choose to wash over situations. So as we close this morning... I want to ask you two questions. Two questions. As you hear these words from the Apostle Paul, question number one, where do you have work to do? Where do you have work to do? What I'm going to do is I'm going to read this passage of grain this morning, and I'm going to ask you to be, answered, to, to be, to, to be um, frank with yourself, honest with yourself, and say, where do I have work to do regarding me and my big mouth? Is it bitterness? Have I said sorry? Is it lack of grace? Am I a wrecking ball? Or I'm good with my mouth? Can you be honest with yourself about all those things? Question number two is this. Who hopes you'll get to work soon? 
Is it somewhere, someone at work, someone on the same team? Is it someone at the, is it a neighbor? Chances are, it's someone very close to you that really hopes you'd get a grip on this new worldview where your mouth is designed to, to build up. Is it, is it, are you just a person who, you know, you just grab it easily to sarcasm? Are you just naturally critical? Paul said, you bought with a price, new world view for you. So let's close this lesson off this morning by reading these injunctions. Can I call them injunctions from the Apostle Paul? He said, listen, this is what you have to do. And we'll start with verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to the needs that it might benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. He said, oh no, when you speak badly of somebody else, he said, oh, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every other, with, with every form of malice. And then sum it all up, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other, just as God, as Christ, just as in Christ, God forgave you. You know what? Some of you are sitting here this morning, but said, Brian, you don't know my story. You, you've never met my boss. You're not married to my wife. You know, you're not married to my wife. You don't know my neighbor. But God does. God, God does. And these are the words of the, of the Spirit through the Apostle Paul. Embrace your new world view. And, and can I ask you this morning, get rid of the fish mouth. Put in words of grace. Can your conversations become a construction site when other people leave you? They've just been built up because of your words. So our final slide this morning, maybe you can remember this for the other couple of weeks. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. Can you repeat that after me? Quick to listen, quick to, and slow to speak. Quick to listen and slow to speak. Let's stand together as we uh, sing. Beyond this land of parting, losing and leaping, far beyond the past, darkening this, and far beyond the day 